Our uh, next speaker is another uh, presidential award winner and uh, is uh, now part of the intramural program of the NIBIB to show how versatile the Institute has become. Uh, Harry Schroff will be our guest speaker and he'll be speaking about new technologies for high spatial and temporal resolution imaging of cells and organisms. Harry, it's great to have you. Thank, thank you. All right, so uh, before I get started here, I just want to thank Rod for uh, letting me put, be part of this uh, 10th, anniversary, uh, 10th anniversary celebration. It's, it's a great honor to, to be here, and especially in the company of such uh, great speakers. So um, my, I'm a microscopist by training, and I try and think about ways of improving microscopes that are commercially available. Most of my work is not on sort of large organisms like humans or mice, although I seem to be sort of moving in that direction because I, I started out studying single cells I'm going to tell you a bit uh, today about our work on C. elegans, and I've, I've been also starting to work on, on zebrafish a bit. So half of my lab works on mechanisms for improving the spatial resolution of microscopes, in particular getting past the diffraction limit of light, which is about 250 nanometers in size. And although um, I have lots of pretty pictures from that side of the lab, I thought instead I'd tell you sort of a different story. Um, I'd, I'd tell you a bit about um, imaging, uh, imaging non-invasively and in particular, how to avoid cell torture. So one of the things that, I've, that I learned um, early in my tenure as a microscopist is that it's very easy to fry uh, a single cell. And here you see a fibroblast cultured on a single, on a, on a single cover slip. And you're looking at it in, in bright field modality, but I was also shining a laser on this, uh, on this cell. And you can sort of see it curling up. And, and uh, eventually, if I, if, I, if I were to keep showing you the movie, the, the cell would lift off the cover slip and sort of die a watery death. So, can people hear me, or? All right, maybe I'll. OK. Um, ah, OK. Mandatory. So, uh, so the reason for this is that most microscopes uh, that you can buy are remarkably inefficient. They dose the sample volumetrically. They, they dose the entire volume of the cell, even though we're recording this image with a CCD camera, which is a two-dimensional detector. So I'm going to tell you about a microscopy technique that we, we and others have developed uh, that, is, that is far better and let, let, lets you image effectively much, much longer. So hold that thought in your mind, because now I want to sort of switch gears and motivate the importance of this from, from a biological perspective. Another one of the goals of my lab, other than improving microscopy, is to better understand neurodevelopment in the brain. And so if you think about the human brain, it's, of course, this fantastically complicated organ, uh, you know, billions of neurons, orders of magnitude more synapses. And despite this large number of parts, the brain somehow managed to wire correctly uh, uh, a huge amount of the time. How this precise connectivity happens in vivo is still not very well understood. But one thing should be clear from the sort of mismatch in numbers. This kind of complexity is somehow coded for by about 25,000 gene products, even though there are trillions of sort of functional parts that make up the nervous system. Merely cataloging the genes and their functions is not going to be enough to sort of understand how this thing wires. What you really want is sort of a movie of how the entire brain forms at subcellular resolution. But unfortunately, with today's technology, we can't do this for the human brain. So if you jump down a few orders of magnitude and complexity and think about a much simpler organism, the C. elegans worm, this is a beast that has only 302 neurons, about 5,000 chemical synapses, most of, most of which have been mapped at the EM level of, of resolution. And the sort of gene number here is about 20,000. This is a simple enough system. It's transparent. Um, its lineage has been worked out. It's something where you could, you could really ask with a microscope how these genes act in vivo to direct wiring. You can ask, where are the neurons? How did they get there? Where are the axons? Um, if you want to look for general principles, I would argue the worm embryo is a good place to start. And for those of you that think that the worm embryo is too far removed from the human, I would just point out that there have been uh, two, arguably three, Nobel Prizes that have involved this, this worm. Uh, one for sort of programmed cell death, uh, you know, one, one kind of involving GFP. And then uh, I should also say that technologies like RNA uh, interference have all, are also very easy to deploy in this, in this uh, organism. So what I'm really after is sort of a four-dimensional atlas of neurodevelopment, sort of a dynamic Google, Google map for the worm where I can optically reconstruct where are all the cells at every point in, in development, both, both uh, in space and in time, uh, where are all the processes. And if you had such an atlas of cell motions and cell processes, you could then map onto this atlas uh, transcription factor uh, uh, expression dynamics. And I should say this is a collaboration with a neuroscientist at Yale and a, neuro and a developmental biologist at, at Sloan Kettering. So this is sort of the goal. How do we get to this goal? Well, um, given the fact that we have these awesome tools like green fluorescent protein and given the great uh, genetic control we have in, 
see elegans, you can actually label all the neurons in the worm. And the problem is that you label typically all the neurons, and that creates a contrast problem. So one of the things you need is a way of selectively marking sparse subsets of neurons. Otherwise, you have, you have all of them light up, and you can't distinguish one from another. Even if you have uh, worm lines, genetically uh, 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 modified worm lines that give you a few transcription factors expressed in a few uh, select neurons, you don't always know which neurons those are. And so what you need to be able to do for this atlas is identify which cell is which. And this is actually not a crazy idea, because you can track nine out of 10 rounds of cell division already just by following the pattern of cell divisions in the worm embryo. And you can do this computationally. So this is a computationally derived lineage tree. And then the reason that I'm interested in this problem is that you need a way of imaging this fast volumetrically and without killing the worm. And that's, that's quite a difficult thing. So um, why is this sort of a, a challenge? If you look at sort of a cartoon of the C. elegans embryo in cross-section, it's about the size of a large culture itself. So it's about 40 to 50 microns laterally and about 20 or 30 microns thick. And what I'm after is an atlas that gets you the position of all the cells to subcellular resolution. So what I'd like to do is sort of carve this embryo up optically into diffraction-limited voxels of less than a micron in size. And I'd like to do this over the 14-hour developmental time period of the worm. So, so how might you illuminate the worm to get this sort of information back in your fluorescence microscope? One thing you can do is simply illuminate the entire volume of the worm. That's called wide-field imaging or epifluorescence imaging. So if you shine a laser beam throughout the volume, you get fluorescence everywhere through the volume. And if the worms are very thin, this might be the way to go. There's probably no better way for very thin samples. Uh, it's very fast because all you have to do is move the plane of focus through the volume and build up a, build up a, a, a volumetric stack. But you have the problem of out-of-focus blur. There's no optical sectioning in this illumination strategy. And you also have a tremendous problem with out-of-focus bleaching and damage. So you might be visualizing a plane down here, but if you're illuminating the entire stack, then you're bleaching the fluorescence that occurs up here. Sort of a, another thing you might think about doing is using a confocal microscope. And just to review this, the idea is you have a laser beam, you focus it into the sample, and then you scan this laser beam around in the sample. And for every, uh, for every position of the laser beam, you, can, you record the fluorescence signal. You use a confocal pinhole to reject the out-of-focus light, <coughs> except in the vicinity of focus. And this, this, this is sort of a workhorse tool. You can buy one. It's, it's prevalent everywhere. And unlike the wide field microscope, it gives you optical sectioning, and it can, and it can give you near diffraction limited resolution. But the problem is that if you, if you look at what this looks like in the context of the worm embryo, it, like the wide field microscope, also bleaches out of focus. So you also have the only useful information you gain at any instant of time is from the vicinity of focus. But you have this sort of cone of this hourglass shape of excitation that wastes the uh, fluorescence up and, up and below the focal plane. This is also intrinsically slow because it's a point scanning technique. So you record one piece of information here, but then you have to scan this excitation this way, up and down, and into and, and, into and out of the page. Uh, and, and in order to make that fast, you usually have to take, uh, take the laser and turn the, inten the intensity up, and that, that uh, frequently fries your sample. So conceptually, anyway, um, you can do much better if you just illuminate one plane at a time. You use a light sheet to illuminate only the plane that you're detecting. And then to build up a volume, you can scan this light sheet uh, in one direction that's very fast. If you tailor the light sheet the right way, you can minimize out-of-focus bleaching and damage. The idea of using light sheets in microscopy is actually nothing new. The Germans were doing it in 1903 and 1904 and investigating colloidal suspensions. But the, this technique has undergone a renaissance in the last decade, ago, uh, a decade or so, especially in the context of developmental biology. And they sort of undergo, they, they go by this acronym, Selective Plane Illumination Microscope uh, Techniques, or SPIM techniques. Um, just to give you an idea of what these microscopes have looked like historically, um, some of the early work was done in, in, uh, in fish. And so you take your fish and embed it in an agarose cylinder, put that agarose cylinder in a water-filled chamber, and then come in from one side with a light sheet. You detect the fluorescence in this perpendicular detection, and you scan the light sheet very fast in this direction, and build up this optically sectioned volume. And so you can, this, this, this is movie is from almost, uh, you know, from quite a while ago, but it's still pretty illustrative. If you were to use, do the same imaging where you eliminate the entire volume, you have this, all this out of focus blur. But if you do this light sheet based volumetric imaging, you can get very optically clear images of, in this case, this fish embryo. And if you have the time to rotate the sample around, you can really fill in this volume very beautifully and with a minimum of damage to the sample. So, this technology has, has been around for, for a number of years, but there are very few of these actually around, and it has not yet been deployed in the market. And part of the reason for this is that this is really a pain in the ass to build. So um, as a tool developer, as a microscopist, I started thinking about ways of 
making this sort of easier to use. And the solution we came up with is something we called inverted microscope-based spin, based or I-spin. So the idea that we had is to just implement this geometry um, in place of the bright field illumination pillar of a conventional epifluorescence microscope. So you have these two perpendicular objectives. In my case, the worm embryo sits over here on a glass cover slip at the focus of both objectives. Um, and then you, you, you bring in the light sheet via this objective, and you scan it in this direction, and the fluorescence gets sent to a camera. The advantage of this geometry is that you can use conventional sample mounting uh, uh, protocols like glass cover slips, and you can investigate the sample before you do the spin imaging using the lower conventional optical uh, microscope train. So you can look at it di at different magnifications. If you want, you can do photo activation. You can, you can do lots of different things using this flexible approach. So uh, we sort of built this system, and then we started to prototype it on uh, C. elegans embryos. And I'm going to show you just a few movies. Um, this, is, this is one example of a C. elegans embryo from the two-stage stage, eventually all the way to hatching. And what, I'm, what is displayed here are the positions of the nuclei. The nuclei have been marked with a GFB histone marker. And using this light sheet microscope, we can collect about 25,000 volumes over the course of embryogenesis. We can image every two seconds uh, over about 14 hours without frying this worm. And this was a good control for us because all of the cell divisions have been studied in great detail uh, in, in the 80s. And we detect no difference using this imaging modality uh, uh, in, the, in the pattern of sort of stereotyped cell divisions, the embryos all hatch on time. This is about 30 times faster than a confocal spinning disc, which is sort of the state-of-the-art fast optical microscope you might, you might buy commercially. One of the things you notice uh, that is a little bit of an imaging nightmare is that after the muscles form, the embryo starts to twitch pretty rapidly. So you have to image super fast to be able to still resolve these individual cells, but we can do that. For the most part, you can track these individual cells, although there is a, a bit of motion blur. And if I kind of uh, advance this movie over here, what you find um, repeatedly is that eventually the, the, the worm hatches out of the eggshell and goes on to make more worms. So it is indeed non-invasive. Um, and so this was sort of a good uh, proof of concept for us. What I'm really after, though, is the, uh, the neurons. And so as a proof of concept, another proof of concept, we built a worm strain that had only a few neurons highlighted. And again, I've sort of taken this four-dimensional movie and in the interest of time, sort of broken it up into four different time segments. In this particular movie, there are about four neurons that you can kind of see uh, see over here. Uh, they start out at the anterior end of the embryo, and if I advance this movie, you see that they kind of crawl from the anterior end uh, to the posterior end. And once the embryo starts to twitch, all hell breaks loose, but you can still, even after the muscles twitch, observe sort of by eye the motion of these individual cells. Uh, a little later, you can see that two of these cells form axons, which are these sort of long, uh, long structures over here. And if I, uh, maybe if I pause the movie, um, I, I, I can even point out that there are growth cones at the very end of these axons. They're a little, little clearer uh, maybe in this movie over here. So you, you can actually see uh, submicron type structures in this microscope, and you can actually follow and track these cells um, uh, you know, using, using this non-invasive microscope. And I, I also want to point out that this is a pretty dynamic system. So the, the neurons start out in a morphology that is nowhere near where they end up. And I would argue that you really want to do this kind of dynamic imaging to see how the neuro neurodevelopment happens instead of fixing an embryo and looking at many thousands of fixed embryos. It's much easier to see what's going on if you have one embryo and can follow the sort of developmental progression uh, throughout time. Now, when we built this strain, we didn't actually know what the identity of these neurons were. And in compiling this atlas, that's sort of a necessary component. So um, just, as, uh, just, as, just to show that that's possible, you can, you can do multiple color imaging where you label all the nuclei in red, let's say, the neurons in green. And then you can, you can, if you can correlate the position of the uh, nuclei with the neurons, then you can, you can, so for example, this particular cell over here, it's moving a little fast. Let me, uh, let me, let me bring it back. Uh, this guy over here, you can sort of see, you can correlate where the, the nucleus is and, the, uh, and the, uh, the cytoplasmic signal. And so you can build up these lineage trees and actually identify these neurons as these particular names, which, which really don't mean much to me. But, um, but, but at least in principle, you can do this sort of analysis for all of the neurons in this worm and then identify each one from the data itself. Now, uh, given this kind of data, you can do sort of cell biological studies. You can ask how long are these neurites as a function of time? Uh, you know, where are they in relationship to another? I'm just going to illustrate one, one uh, piece of information that we learned from these movies. If you take one of these neurons, this so-called ALA neuron, what you find if you look at wormatlas.org, which documents where all these things end up in the adult worm, you find that this neurite sort of kinks back and then goes towards the tail of the, uh, of the embryo, although it projects first the other way. And we can actually see this in our, in our movies. So I've marked over here this ALA neuron 
uh, at about seven hours uh, post-fertilization. And if you look a little bit further, uh, at about seven hours, 15 minutes, you find these kind of outgrowths of this neuron. If you look a little bit further, you find these outgrowths bifurcate. You find this forked structure over here. This forked structure persists uh, for a little while, and then it commits. And then one of the forks disappears, and this neuron goes always in the other direction. So at least in principle, you can use this system to study neurodevelopmental events in vivo as they happen. All right. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish uh, just by discussing sort of where we're going with this technology. One of the things we learned in the course of doing this is that although imaging every two seconds an entire volume of a worm is pretty fast, it's actually not quite fast enough all the time. And so uh, we're, we're trying to push the speed uh, further. We've also, we've also discovered that there's a way of actually increasing the isotropic resolution of this microscope. All of the movies that I showed you were always XY views as opposed to XZ views. And that's because uh, this microscope, as in, like, like any single view microscope, has worse resolution along the optical axis than perpendicular to the axis. There are less angles that give you resolution along the optic axis. One solution to this is to rapidly collect two perpendicular views. And this 90 degree objective geometry actually gives you those. So what we've done is we, we now mount a camera uh, on each arm of this selective plane illumination microscope, record the views from each perpendicular direction, and then we can fuse those and get, get a volumetric time series that is, that is more isotropic. So here's an example of, of that. We're collecting each volume now in less than a second, both views. Um, and then you can see the X, Y, and the X, Z views. What I like about this movie is that it's actually quite difficult to say which direction is which. So performing this multi-view imaging really does even out the isotropy of the, of the movie. And, uh, and again, you know, this is not so uh, damaging to the worm that they don't hatch on time. All the cell divisions also seem to happen uh, on time. Um, these are, these are two areas that we need help on. So, uh, you know, the, the neural strain that we built uh, is one of only a few that has just a few neurons on. Uh, we, need, we need to sort of basically develop lines that have uh, all of the 222 neurons marked uh, sparsely. One, one way that we've thought about doing this is to uh, employ photoactivatable markers that label all the neurons and then go in specifically with a different color laser and activate just a few neurons. The other thing we need to do to compile all of this volumetric data into a digital atlas is to straighten the worm embryos. Because although the uh, embryos themselves have a, have a stereotype developmental program, the twitching, of course, is stochastic. So if you want to compare one embryo to another embryo, you have to align it along a common body axis. So if you have ideas about this, please, please email us. Uh, we're, we're happy to talk about this. And then uh, finally, I'll just say that you can use this system to image many other uh, uh, phenomena besides worms. So you can image things like zebrafish, lateral line. We've, we've started to image interactions between mouse, egg, and sperm. Um, so we'd like to observe the events uh, that happen after the sperm binds, binds to the egg and penetrates the zona pellucida. You can investigate microtubule dyna dynamics, influenza, uh, 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 infection of cells, vesicle transport, anything that uh, you need uh, to require volumetric images pretty fast and without killing the organism, this microscope is, is, is excellent at uh, doing. So with that, um, I think I'll just stop by thanking uh, uh, Richard Leitman and Hank, uh, even the, the, my, my bosses who hired me, uh, various support both inside the NIH and outside and then, and then my lab. Uh, the vast majority of this work was done by Yichang Wu, who, uh, who, who unfortunately is, is, it couldn't be here, but fortunately is having a baby. Um, and then uh, Ali Reza Gitani was a postback who, who also helped him. So thank you. Perhaps uh, time for one question for Dr. Sharp. All right, it's as clear as mud. <laughs> it's exciting. Yeah, yes, please. Of course, you know about vessel plane illumination. How much does that help? So I, I can't, fry, I can't sustain these imaging rates with vessel plane illumination because I fry the embryo. So, so over because you put in energy throughout the volume in that thing, and you rely on these tricks to get rid of the side lobes. It turns out for the embryo, it's too much. Yeah. That, that was one of the first things we tried. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you very much.